Welcome to Refactor This, sponsored by vFunction. In each episode, we talk application modernization tools, concepts, and advice with industry experts. Welcome to the Refactor This podcast. My name is Oliver White, and today I'm joined by Grace Jansen. Grace is a Java champion, a Tech Women 100 award winner, and former biologist who made the leap to tech and now spends her days at IBM as a developer advocate. Grace, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, so great to join you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Um, I just introduced you a little bit, but could you describe, you know, what's your background a little bit and, and what you do as a job for for people who may not uh, understand exactly how you got to where you are now. <laughs> I don't think even I understand how I got <laughs> to where I am. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I feel like you've, you've given a lot of the highlights there. So I guess, yeah, I, I did a biology degree, which gives me a little bit of an unusual background in terms of coming into the world of tech. Um, mm. Actually, pre previously, before I did my biology degree, I actually did work experience at IBM in the site that I now work at. So that was back when I was 13. So I got the bug young, uh, no. but there was no computer science at school. It sucked. Um, you know, IT classes were, this is how you use Excel. This mm -hmm. is how you use PowerPoint. You know, it's super basic. So I did Python programming in my spare time when I was in college. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I ended up going into biology at university because I loved the sciences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had it in my head, yeah, I'll be the next David Attenborough. Didn't quite go that way. Uh, but when I was at uni, I ended up having the opportunity to do a module where I was doing programming and biology, which was really good fun. So I was modeling a biological simulation using um, Python and R and, and programming models like that. Ironically, I was looking at virus spread through airlines, given the current situation, a little ironic. Uh, but that was super interesting. And then wow. kind of got the bug again. How, how so relevant. Came back. I know, right? I did. I had no idea it was going to come and be such a relevant factor. Um, yeah, it was an interesting one. I was using, I was actually using avian flu, so not too far off what was kind of happening. Mm -hmm. And actually, a lot of the friends that I met who were doing postgrads have been contributing to the literature around COVID. Uh, so it's been super interesting to see that area grow. Um, but yeah, so then I moved off biology. I kind of realized that I liked the programming more than the biology. Mm -hmm. So ended up doing an extreme blue summer internship at IBM and then came back as a graduate. So yeah, a bit of a roundabout journey, but I loved every minute of it. So yeah, it gives me an unusual background, but one that gives me a unique set of skill sets, I think. Absolutely. And how did you um, find yourself in the role of developer advocate and, and what do, exactly do you advocate? <laughs> Good question. Um, I, I, I have to say uh, it was a mixture of fortune and um sort of the skill sets that i happen to have in my internship so during my internship at ibm in my penultimate summer of university i was actually spotted by my second line manager and the role i was doing in this internship was a mixture of sort of consultancy with development uh, so we had a real client who was a client of ibm's um, and we were developing a sort of um, demo of a particular technology and solution that we could possibly build for them. Um, so I had to do both a mixture of presentations, documentation, um, and actually developing the application itself. And my manager spotted me and said, Hey, I'm kind of putting together this new team. It's going to be formed sort of around the time that you're joining. Would you like to come and join that team when it sort of happens? Um, and I was like, yeah, this sounds great. She was like, great. It's going to be in Java. I was like, what's Java? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't even know what it was. I had to look it up on Google. Um, I'd never done object oriented programming. So it really was being thrown in the deep end. But um, yeah, so a bit of luck in terms of my manager happening to spot me and um, the team having been formed literally the day I joined. Um, so I joined straight into a developer advocacy role as a graduate, uh, and I've been in that role ever since for the last five years. Um, in terms of what I advocate, it's really a mixture of things. It's evolved as my roles evolved and as sort of the technologies that IBM helps to develop has evolved. Mm -hmm. So the main sort of general topic is cloud native Java. Mm -hmm. And 
I think as most people will know, that includes a wide variety of things. Yeah. So it can be anything from sort of runtimes like Open Liberty uh, through to uh, JVM technologies like Open J9, Semaru runtimes, but it also includes a lot of open source, um, Open Liberty being one of them, but also things like MicroProfile, Dakar TE. I took a look at and, and was doing a lot of around reactive systems for a while mm -hmm. um, and really how to get those into a state of uh, being able to thrive in the cloud. So looking at methodologies, cloud native technologies like Kubernetes, Docker, et cetera, test containers. So yeah, yeah a, a wide variety of things, but focused on cloud native Java. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, and I, it's... IBM has been a, a, around for longer <laughs> than many might suspect. Yeah. And it, you know, it's, it's pretty well known that a lot of IBM customers are working with applications that were built 10, 15, even 20 years ago, yep, they're, absolutely. you know, they're running on versions of IBM WebSphere and maybe trying to migrate to Open Liberty. Um, and as, as you're admittedly, um, some, you know, your, your background doesn't encompass the, the work that was done in the yeah. early 2000s or even the 1990s. <clears throat> so as, as, an, as an advocate for cloud native Java technologies, what what sort of conversations do you have with people that are working with legacy applications that are mission critical? They're providing the core of of, of an enterprise's business flows and, and everything else, and they're looking to embrace cloud native Java. Um, what sort of uh, stories have you have you come across? Yeah, it's it's a common phenomenon, I think. Um, you know, these are important applications. As you say, they're running mission critical workloads. Uh, it is not a trivial thing to just turn around and say, yeah, scrap it. Let's do something cloud native. Um, yeah, you know, there's, no, there's no greenfield opportunity uh, no, on the horizon. In a lot of these companies. Yeah, um, it's just not something they can do. So I think a lot of the common trends that occur when we're looking at uh, trying to help our customers um, and also people who you know are just in open source or in the community trying to help them move from a more legacy monolithic style application to modernizing um, is we often find that uh, there's, there's sort of I would say two aspects to this there's the organizational people aspect mm -hmm. and then there's the actual code itself right. um, and I think a lot of organizations forget about the organizational people aspect uh, because a lot of them get excited by the technologies and mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, they are very exciting and they offer some fantastic benefits moving to cloud infrastructure, uh, moving your architecture to a more cloud native style, um, utilizing new tools and technologies. But if your organization isn't ready for that, there's no point in doing it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if for example, you're unable, if you have a monolith that you're unable to scale or maintain, it's just going to be harder if you make it microservices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you have teams, for example, that have a very hierarchical structure, so all of the communication comes from top down, you have to ask for permission to be able to uh, sort of put new code in because you depend perhaps on other teams. If you've got that structure in your organization, that's not going to work when you're trying to build microservices, as an example, because you're essentially going to be building a microservice that heavily depends on another team mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to have the sort of autonomy to be able to maintain and develop that microservice as a bounded context, um, you know, something that is decoupled from everything else. So I think one of the major learning curves and I would say one of the major blockers isn't necessarily technical. It's often organizational people resources. You know, do you have the money, the time, and the skill set in your people to be able to make that move to, to that new technology or that new architecture or that new infrastructure. Um, and if you don't, maybe take a look at your organization first. Take a look at your structure in terms of your team structure, your communication structure, um, and map out how that would work if you were to move to um, a different style of architecture or technology. But I think mm -hmm. for me, that's one of the main horror stories is, is people migrate and they end up having like a, a distributed monolith, essentially. Right. <laughs> so you've got all the negatives of both systems, yeah. <laughs> uh, which just sucks for everyone yeah. involved. 
Um, you know, you've got the issue of having to maintain tons of different microservices, potentially, depending on your application, while still having this strong coupling between microservices. So you can't actually develop a microservice as a microservice. So uh, you just get all this negativity and nobody's a winner. So really, yeah, they're the main st horror stories I hear is the fact that the organization isn't ready for it and you end up making a distributed monolith. Yeah, th this is absolutely what, what tends to happen. I, th I think we've uh, referred to these as both um, uh, mono services and micro lifts, <laughs> micro lifts and uh, even mini services. Yep. Yeah, we've also we've also seen a lot of the. Um, I, I like how you how you describe an organizational structure uh, that has been built or rather formed around a monolithic system, and how the organizational structure often mimics the architectural structure of the application. Yep. Absolutely. And, you know, if if you're going to go with microservices, you you can't have a team of 200 developers all working on one app, and it needs to be split up. Um, do you think that so uh, skipping skipping a little bit to the fact that many of us are working from home or in a re remote environment, we're not all going into the office anymore, mm. uh, at least for the last few years. It's not very obvious that we're going to have a strong return to that. I think maybe something yeah. in the middle, like maybe two or three days a week in a office with face masks, potentially. Um, do you think that the the, the remote employment uh, situation that has kind of grown over the last couple years with the COVID-19 pandemic is potentially a helpful um, uh, let's say a helpful source of structure when it comes to making microservices since we the individual team members are distributed already just like a microservice would be uh yeah you have absolutely. any thoughts on that yeah i think it's it's definitely sort of pushing us in the right direction of as you say mimicking what our organization structure is like and what our application structure is like because as you say often we end up mirroring the two mm. um and so by having us distributed it's made us, uh, if we haven't already been adopting these, it's made us adopt communication uh, apps or styles that are more asynchronous. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I might be based in a completely different time zone to someone else in my team, but I still need to be able to communicate with them uh, and to be able to, I, I shouldn't be able to be blocked on something that I'm working on, waiting for that response if they're five hours behind in America, for example. Right. Um, so having that more asynchronous style and also it's sort of pushed us to use um, sort of autonomous tooling. So for example, uh, along the DevOps pipeline, for example, mm -hmm. uh, whereas previously we might have been using some kind of a VM locally, perhaps uh, through a shared network in our office, or perhaps using servers that we have on site. Uh, now we're utilizing sort of DevOps pipelines where we're um, pushing to remote repositories and we're able to have a much more asynchronous flow of code as well as of communication. So I think our general development practices are moving more in the direction of what we want to be having in our cloud native applications. And so as a result, I think it will be easier for us to be able to utilize those tools and communication styles in our own applications as well as as people. Um, so I think it's definitely helpful I, it, it can be difficult. I'm not saying remote working is is the way to go, <laughs> it has and everyone challenges. Just, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, there is still the challenge of I do still have to wait those five hours to get my response. I might be able to get on with something else, but perhaps I'll need to wait for that to get on with that particular thing, whatever mm -hmm. it may be or task. Um, so there are still challenges. There's also the challenge of how do you give people access to particular systems in a secure way when you're not perhaps in a firewall or using a secure Wi-Fi, um, that can be a challenge for many organizations using uh, sensitive data as an example. Mm -hmm. um, so there are challenges with remote working, but I think generally it can be a, a helpful step in the right direction for us when it comes to um, mimicking those cloud native structures in our organization. Yeah, I, I would say I, I agree with you. Um, the I would say there's a couple industry verticals, if we want to use that term, that mm -hmm. are especially challenged with the concept of remote work, such as financial services, exactly. healthcare, government, um, defense. Uh, 
yeah. uh, things like this. So if, if we're all uh, if we're all working on you know e-commerce sites uh, <laughs> for for European markets, we can kind of be anywhere. But uh, for example, Solid a bank for that is running you know processing a billion dollars a day in transactions like one of our clients uh mm -hmm. they can't exactly you know send all of their employees out to out to the remote ends of the earth and and keep going yeah i also wanted to ask you about the um the alignment between what we're doing with uh code and devops pipelines and builds and jvm optimizations all of that is seems to have been uh, evolving into a very, uh, a very nicely formed um, ecosystem where automation, asynchronicity, all of these, all of these things that we want out of our microservices, you know, independent scale and so on. But then looking back at the human aspect of it, the the developers and architects and executives that are working on these apps. The technology is, has almost leapfrogged the cognitive ability to uh, to communicate uh, asynchronously. So we've got GitHub and merges and branches and all this great stuff. But how do, how does that work its way backwards into the company culture? Yeah, guess, it's uh, it's a tricky one, yeah. especially because as you say, it's developed so quickly. It's often the case that you know, you blink and suddenly the industry is five steps ahead of you when you're about to try and take your step, first step. So sometimes, you know, looking at all of this uh, evolution of tools and technologies, sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming and you can think, how am I ever going to be able to turn my you know, monolithic application into something that's utilizing all of this different uh, technology, methodologies, infrastructure, and mm -hmm. it's about, I think, taking a step back and really utilizing um, your organization structure and resources and taking it one step at a time. Mm -hmm. So analyzing, OK, do we have the structure in place, the resources in place to be able to do X, Y and Z out of X, Y and Z? What is the priority? Let's focus on that first. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be done all at once. Um, and I think you know, these tools are fantastic and they work really well together, but they can also work effectively in isolation. So if you've only got the time to perhaps implement uh, something like moving from a local repository to a remote repository like GitHub, for example, to be able to enable that sort of more remote working, um, asynchronous style of uh, code mergers and things like that, then then make that change and then reevaluate. It doesn't have to be okay, when I move to GitHub, I then have to employ things like Jenkins to be able to do my pipeline and I need to be automating my tests. So I need to implement, I don't know, like test containers. It, it doesn't have to be done at once. So just take it one step at a time, prioritize what your application needs the most in terms of what's gonna be the most helpful to you in your modernization journey. And the, the <laughs> challenging, but also great thing about modernization journeys is they are specific. Mm -hmm. There is no recipe right. book that you can just pick up and be like, oh, great, I'll follow these steps. Yeah. Because what worked for one application doesn't necessarily work for another. So um, it, it really is about trying to map out that modernization journey. And believe me, that will change because as you go through that modernization journey, there might be developments or evolutions of technology or your application. There might be changes from requirements from your stakeholders. And so that modernization journey will need to change. And that's about being agile, which also sort of comes into it in terms of that organizational culture. Um, being agile, being able to adapt and change uh, and modify that plan uh, to do what's best for your application, not just this was the plan, we will stick to it. Um, so take it one step at a time, plan out that journey and reevaluate that journey as you complete each step, because you might need to change it depending on what's going on around you. Yeah, that's, that would probably be that's my advice. Ex, that, yeah, that's excellent advice uh, for developers and architects that are looking to, you know, take baby steps towards um, making something change. What what would what do you tell these same people when it comes to getting executive sponsorship for a major uh, application modernization initiative? Um, yeah. What you know. It's great to say, hey, we want to start using GitHub and Jenkins 
but at some point, a development team is going to run into a wall where just approval and planning and project visibility is going to play become far more important than making incremental um, improvements. Um, what what do you think executives need to understand uh, when before they agree to embark on a, on a big modernization project? Yeah, it's a tricky one, right? Yeah. Because this is where we get into politics. And this I don't is ask where... easy questions, you know? No, God, no. It's, it's straight into the deep end with this. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, right, it's, there's this politics is where we... involved. There's, yeah, yeah, there's politics. culture involved. Um... Totally. There's also finance, which mm -hmm. as developers, we don't necessarily always have a view of. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're in the code and, and some developers might be looking beyond that and might be always involved in the finance or the operations or the um, sort of as we say, politics of the organization. But a lot of the time we not, might not be. And this is where we have to pick up those skills to be able to convince others who perhaps don't have an understanding of the technologies we want to use, why it's worth it. Um, and really it's about, okay, understanding who you're addressing. Are you addressing finance? Are you addressing operations? Are you addressing uh, just the sort of like HR or general CEO or CTO? depending on who you're addressing is going to depend on what you're showing them because everyone in an organization has goals to meet. Mm -hmm. And so if you're able to help them meet those goals or really, really specify the message that you're putting across to what they care about, then it's going to have more of an impact than if you just go on on a rant or, or a spiel about how amazing a technology is because they're yeah, not going to care. Right. Um, right. It's as simple as that. A CIA so, doesn't doesn't necessarily care that there's a, a new framework for yeah. the front end. Exactly, like it might be to... mega exciting to you, but right. they couldn't care less. Uh, so it's about really understanding how you can translate that exciting new technology, you know, a, a front end framework, for example. How can you translate that into, if you're talking to finance, for example, into cost savings? So by utilizing this new fr uh, framework for front end, actually, because it's regularly maintained, uh, because it has all this support from various different vendors, maybe because it's open source, uh, actually, we can get rid of that license that we're paying for in proprietary, we can save money there. Or yeah. actually, I'll be able to develop much faster because uh, I'll be able to utilize the newest technologies and be up to date and I won't have a legacy code that I'll need to spend a while getting rid of, for example, in my application. That's a cost saving. So it's about analyzing who you're speaking to and tailoring your message to that person. If it's operations, focus on the operational uh, sort of uh, optimizations that you'll be making through these these moves. Uh, if it's your general CTO or CEO, make it specific to them. You know, we're going to need less people to work on this. We're going to uh, what it's going to mean that we have better client satisfaction, or maybe uh, it enables our teams to work better together because of this optimization or automation. So make sure that you're understanding uh, sort of beyond just the technical excitement and understanding what business impact that could have to be able to translate that and really get across the fact that this isn't just a cool feature, like mm -hmm. this is needed in the application because of X, Y, and Z. So just make sure you do your research beforehand and really make sure that you're tailoring that message. That, that would be my main advice. I, I think that's excellent advice to follow. Um, what do you think when you hear the terms migration versus modernization <laughs> what, what what springs to mind and and as a little background uh oftentimes like like you were saying earlier what what you really don't want to have is a distributed monolith in the cloud that suddenly you're paying a lot for you know instances um mm -hmm. so uh, you know what we've termed as lift and shift uh, yeah. we, we've started to refer to as migration, whereas modernization, we're actually thinking about refactoring the business logic, getting into the original code, uh, mm -hmm. helping, you know, starting to create bounded contexts for functionality into microservices, uh, removing, you know, getting rid of the tight coupling as much as possible, eradicating lots of uh, circular dependencies and, and so on and, and so forth. So um, without putting words in your mouth, <laughs> um, 
you know, what, what what experience have you have you seen when it comes to migrating versus modernizing, and what is the what is the impact on on a team's thinking when when they want to let's say modernize their application? Is there an opportunity to migrate some services and that will be good enough? Versus how do you know when you need to really modernize something, refactor, rewrite, re-architect? Um, what, what do you have to say on, on those topics? I feel like this is almost like a million dollar question, right? This is literally what organizations are spending so much money trying to solve. And this yeah. is why there are tools and, and out you're there. On, you're on the help. hook for telling us how. <laughs> No. <laughs> no pressure. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting subject because often people use those terms almost as like together. They often just right. mix them up Inter as if there's no difference. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. As if there's no difference between the two. And actually, as you mentioned, that there is quite a large difference between just lifting and shifting, migrating that app onto the cloud, for example, versus. Uh, modernizing what you actually have within that application. I think there are cases where it can still be helpful to do um, what I would call activities that I would put under migration. Mm -hmm. So for example, the first step in your modernization journey might be, as in this is the whole modernization, might be a migration. And that might be a step within modernization. Mm -hmm. So you might say, okay, my application is running on-prem. What I'd like to do is start utilizing the cloud. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna containerize my application and lift and shift to the cloud. Mm -hmm. That might be your first step in your modernization journey. Now, although you've gained the benefits of containerization, uh, thus you might be able to have greater portability and flexibility in your cloud provider, for example, mm -hmm. you haven't gained the advantages of utilizing Re and really utilizing and thriving off that cloud infrastructure underneath. Your application is still a monolith at the end of the day. And, so and that's this is where, where you might find the expenses are, are rising at a uh, exactly. terrifying rate. Um, Depending on how you've set up your cloud provisioning. Right. Uh, because you might have it where you know, you've set a limit based on your budget. And so you're going to have less spiraling costs because you know what you're spending. But as a result, your application performance might not be optimal. So it really is a balance between, you know, controlling your spend because most of us, um, most of developers out there don't work for an organization with infinite money. And so we have to set a limit because we have a limited budget. And so it's really uh, getting that optimization between performance of your application, really trying to follow that migration and that modernization journey. Uh, whilst also making sure that we're not overspending and that we are actually gaining benefits from that move. So I would say that migration can be useful as a step in modernization, mm -hmm. but if you're really going to take advantage of that underlying infrastructure, we need to be looking at, okay, not just lift and shifting, but actually making changes to our application to enable that modernization to be cloud native. Um, because you can be an application on the cloud that doesn't make you a cloud native app. Um, yes. That's the next step. That's definitely true. Um, what sort of architecture patterns do you do you like when it comes to embracing a modernization initiative? So, let's say as a first step, we want we want to try to see what can we just migrate to the cloud, and mm -hmm. can that provide enough benefits for us to say this sort of functionality or this sort of service? We can migrate and it's going to be fine, but when it comes down to the core, the core functionality, we can't just shove a monolith into the cloud and be happy. Yeah. Um, so, for example, the the Strangler Fig pattern is, yeah. is one that's, that's, that's very, very popular. Martin Fowler actually introduced this concept something like seventeen years ago. Yeah. Um, which is which is a, a compliment in his direction for for being so <laughs> forward thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the so for example, the strangler fig pattern, we've also seen in terms of maybe a little bit further down the road for microservices, the saga pattern for yep. communication. But let's say we're trying to carve off a piece of functionality. How does the, do you, would you suggest the strangler fig pattern is a useful uh, paradigm to follow? And have you suggested yeah. it before yourself? Yeah, yeah, actually. So it is a really interesting, it's so interesting that most of the methodologies that we're using and that we're following 
actually were introduced quite a long time ago. We in just biology. weren't ready for them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> strang- Look at all the strangler of- fig pattern is a biological. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> it is based on the strangler fig tree. So it's, yeah, it's exactly. like, it's amazing how much inspiration we can get from analogies in nature because nature has literally had millennia to perfect this so I, we should be using that more because it, it's had millennia we've had decades so let's take advantage of that evolution yeah. um, but i think the strangler fig is excellent especially combined with it's sort of a form of what we'd call ddd domain driven design so really right. the point of the strangler pattern is to externalize key functionality from a monolith so really separating out a particular domain and then a partic- that becomes a particular service. Um, so refactoring it based on what are the functions that my application is performing? Is that function able to exist as its own microservice, which can be decoupled from perhaps the core of my monolith? Um, so for example, uh, maybe I'm, I've got a restaurant app uh, or a restaurant website and actually People can come to my restaurant, they can make a booking, they can order their food, uh, they can reserve a table and they can make a payment. Now, perhaps it's the make a payment that actually could be externalized into a, into a, uh, its own microservice because actually all I need to send to it is a figure that they need to pay and it can do the rest of the logic within that. So perhaps it's, it's identifying these various different domains that your application consists of and then analyzing those to determine which of these domains could we externalize first mm-hmm. um, and perhaps be that experimental microservice that we're then going to put into the cloud. Um, and by doing it this way, you don't have to do everything at once. And that's the nice right. thing. You can do it one at a time um, and you can do it over time because your application may change in terms of the domains that are within it. Um, so really, it's it's about taking it one step at a time to modernize gradually. Um, and the nice thing about it is that you don't remove that functionality yet um, straight away in your original application. So if it fails, if your microservice isn't working, you can always roll back to your original monolith Mm -hmm. um, and then figure it out again. So really it's a fairly reliable way of taking that first step in your modernization. So yeah, I really like the strangler fig pattern. I think it's a great start when you're looking at trying to identify which parts of your monolith should be microservices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. so but yeah, I like that. Saga as well. So oh. nothing on yeah. Saga. Um, I mean, I've got to talk about it at the moment, but um, I think it's almost that next step because you it, communication is very important in distributed applications because you can't just make synchronous calls anymore because that would make your microservices coupled. So we need to have asynchronous communication, but there's no point in having, well, there is a slight point, but without microservices, that need decreases. Mm -hmm. So I would say the strangler fig pattern is a good start. And then once you have perhaps one, two, a couple of microservices, we can start to consider, right, now that we have these microservices, do we have the right sort of communication within our application? Um, Is it synchronous or is it asynchronous? Mm -hmm. And that's when we can start making use of other patterns like the saga pattern, event-driven domain, so putting events at the heart of the system rather than direct messages, as an example, mm-hmm. using tools like Kafka um, and MicroProfile LRA, so long running actions. All of these can help in really ensuring that that communication layer is also asynchronous as well as the actual microservices themselves. But I think the first step, uh, which is a good step, is to is to actually make those microservices first. Great. Yeah. So we've mentioned uh, test containers, which which pops up in, in almost all of my conversations. It's a great tool, <laughs> yep. and I, I uh, applaud the the folks that are leading that into the future. Um, there's always Kubernetes, which is a, a love hate thing for a lot of people. <laughs> um, what are what are some other tools and uh, technologies that you have found useful? Um, in terms of application modernization that you would maybe want to give a shout out to? Yeah, Um, so I would say application modernization is a very broad term. So you you could break that down into specifically the application modernization, so the Mm -hmm. code. You could split that down into, okay, what about operational? For example, like how do we, how can we better automate, build pipelines? Exactly, because that's more the operational side of things. You've also got the integration modernization. So how are you integrating with various different APIs? So there's tons of tools that you can use. 
In terms of the actual application, so we're talking like the runtime, for example, that you're making use of. Um, obviously, I help develop OpenDivity, so that's a tool that I would always recommend people have a go with. It's open source, which is the nice thing. Um, the particular aspect about OpenDivity that I like uh, for this particular application, so modernization, is actually the fact that uh, Liberty has zero migration. So it's not, basically what happens is we use features, um, versioned features, which means that instead of when you move up a version of Liberty, for example, mm. um, you don't necessarily have to uh, break your existing application because you have to move up to a new specification or a new version that's come out. Um, instead, what we do is we make a new version of that and we support both. So it means you can move up to the latest version of the runtime without having to make changes to your application. And then when you're ready to make those changes, you can then make those changes when you have a business need to, or you have the resources to. So it means you don't miss out on say security updates or whatever might be in the newest version of the runtime, but you're not forced to make a big deal out of it. Essentially it should be easy to move up to the latest runtime version uh, without breaking my application. Right. So that's the, the biggest benefit I think in open liberty as an example, but there's also tools like at the integration level, Kafka is a big favorite of mine. Um, I really enjoy the fact that a it's open source. I'm a big advocate for open source. Um, and the fact that it's quite easy to set up and use. Um, and I actually have an application example where I've, I've got a reactive app, uh, working with Kafka. So mm -hmm. check that out if you're interested. Um, and then there's also other tools that are specific to those, uh, those sort of ideas that we were mentioning, the strangler fig pattern, taking those first steps into, okay, I've got a monolith. How do I migrate that to be a microservice? Mm -hmm. Um, so things like, for example, monitor micro. So that's an IBM tool that really utilizes uh, AI automation to suggest which domains are within your application and where you might be able to abstract out microservices. Um, and actually it, it gives you an idea of how you could do that using Liberty. So I like the integration between the two, which mm -hmm. is why I, I often use it. Um, but really there are, yeah, there's a plethora of tools. I would say open Liberty, Kafka, uh, monitor micro transformation advisor, um, and just generally methodologies like the ones we've been discussing. So strangler fig, event driven architecture, DDD, um, and just sort of things like the 12 factor app methodology. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are fantastic methodologies that you can follow and then implement those tools as part of like micro profile, Jakarta EE, all of this fantastic open source that really enables you to take advantage of the cloud and implement those benefits into your applications. Yeah, they'd be the main ones I'd highlight. I would uh, I would uh, add a, add the comment that um, mono to micro has has a little bit of overlap with what we do at V Function. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, it's interesting to see kind of how 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 we can use uh, AI and automation and machine learning to help inform uh, modernization efforts so that architects and developers can make the right decisions and. And move yeah, because I think that's almost the hardest part. The hardest part is you look Knowing at this. Where to start. Yeah, because yeah. it looks huge, and you're like, where on earth do I begin? Even as an architect, you might know every part of that application. It can still sometimes be overwhelming. Mm. So if we can help automate that in any way, that's a mm. massive help to just kickstart that modernization process. So you're not stuck just staring at a blank wall. Yeah. Yeah. That, so that brings me to one of the, one of my final questions. Um, what what sort of advice would you give to a let's say a, a senior developer who has been you know maybe getting towards retirement, but they're still working with uh, a legacy application that's twenty years old? What would you say to that sort of person to give them a little hope? I would say there is you know there are so many projects that are happening at the moment where whether it's an open source tool that helps make it easier or whether it's an example application of someone else who shared their story you're, you're not alone in wanting to make those modernizations um, and improvements to your application and it might feel like an uphill battle because you've got an application that might be slightly older and so a little bit more complicated you might have um, pressure coming from executives uh, to keep mm -hmm. the old application or perhaps 
um, sort of, it might be difficult to persuade them about modernization in terms of resource costs. Or, but, or, or your executive team has given you a, a mandate to move to the yes. cloud without actually understanding that what this it means. Will raise <laughs> <laughs> expenses yeah. if it's not refactored and modernized, right? Yeah. Yeah, they just expect it, as you say, they just expect you to be able to lift and shift with no costs involved. And that's not necessarily always going to be best for your application. So don't feel like you're alone. As a senior developer, often we feel the weight of the world on our shoulders because we're protecting perhaps the more junior developers. Um, and we're also taking on that pressure from executives in whatever form it might take. Mm. But really there's a big community out there who are helping to work on tools, who are sharing their stories. Um, there are plenty of conference talks and presentations that are available of people who have done this and the lessons they have learned. So take that advice, speak to the community, really, take the time to do research into, okay, if we were to do this, what tools would I need? What technologies would I need to do? What steps would I need to put in place? Break it down, make it into smaller chunks that are more manageable and perhaps break those up into, like we would with development, into sprints, as an example. Yeah. Make it agile because you might get to the point where you get halfway through that modernization journey and actually you've achieved enough for those executives or you've, you've perhaps uh, you're lacking on resources at that particular moment. And actually you can pause and resume it later. So plan out your journey, speak to the open source community, learn from other stories and, and sort of journeys that they've taken and the lessons they've learned, and then take all that knowledge and apply it and, and propose a realistic proposal to your executives. Um, and also communicate that with the, with the more junior devs as well. So they're also in the loop. Everyone's, got this open communication, uh, you've planned it thoroughly, and you've then got a detailed plan that you can follow um, and that they're aware of how many resources you, you might need for that. that. That would be my big advice, yeah. Well, you, you make it sound uh, so hopeful and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and possible. I, I'll include your address and home phone number in the uh, <laughs> show notes. I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> Well, yeah, maybe Grace. it's my uh, my youthful optimism, but yeah. um, but well, I mean, when you break it down, it does become easier. So hopefully, just taking those steps will will make it at least a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Not saying it's an easy process. Well, Grace, it has really been a pleasure speaking with you today. I hope we can meet again in person. Uh, I would love sometime that in, in the next decade. Yes. Uh, that brings us to the end of our podcast. And for our listeners who would like to have a little bit of fun at the end, let's go to the lightning round. Are you ready, Grace? So ready. All Bring right. it on. What is the last song you listened to? That is Running by Pharrell Williams, which is actually the soundtrack to Hidden Figures. Great movie. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay. Good song. Yeah. What do you do to stay healthy? I play a very rogue sport called Korfball. Uh, it is Dutch, kind of like basketball, but mixed. So boys and girls together. It's great. Look it up if you've not heard of it. How do you spell it? K-O-R-F and then ball, B-A-L-L. -L. Korf ball. Yeah, that's the one. I have never heard of that. And I'm going <laughs> to definitely look it up. What is one of your favorite comfort foods? Oh, it has to be spaghetti carbonara. I think I could live purely off spaghetti carbonara if given the option. Um, I just love Italian food and specifically that dish. What is one of your favorite movies? Okay, so this is probably going to show my age a little, but um, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, because <laughs> my dad and I used to read it together when I was a kid, and we always went to all the cinema openings together, so it holds like a special place in my heart. Very nice. Well, that brings us to the next question. What are three books everyone should read aside from Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone? <laughs> or I believe in America, I was they, to they maybe called it the Sorcerer's Stone. Yes, yeah, in America, uh, they call it right? the Sorcerer's Stone. <laughs> yeah, 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 which I always find funny. Um, in, in French, they've changed the name of Hogwarts to Poudlard because they struggle with the huh at the beginning. I always find that funny. Um, yeah, in, so it's in, uh, where, where I live in Prague, Czech Republic, they've absolutely changed the names of some of the characters. <laughs> so Harry is still Harry, and so is Ron and, and Hermione, but um, others are, I think uh, Dumbledore is called like Boombaral or something. <laughs> I, 
I don't Amazing. know. It's very weird. I love it. What are what are what are three books uh, outside of the Harry Potter series that you feel like everyone should read? So I've chosen uh, one which is nonfiction, one that's fiction, and one that's related to work. So the nonfiction is The Secret Barrister, which I found really interesting. So it's it's about sort of the behind the scenes of the uh, of being a lawyer, of being a barrister in the English law system. Mm-hmm. So it, it's really funny, written in a really ironic way. So I really like that book. Um, Shadow and Bone, which is a fictional book. Uh, set in a very fictional world but actually for those who don't like reading it's also on netflix so if anyone doesn't like reading but likes the sound of it then you can check it out there as well um and then the work related book is head first java the third edition um i know trisha quite well and so yeah she was able to uh she asked me to to read it uh, to give some sort of forward on it and honestly it is fantastic the humor in it is just incredible so a really great way to either refresh your java or, or learn java afresh so we're i believe we're we're speaking about our mutual friend trisha g yeah that's the who one is, yep. uh who, who is a a future guest on this podcast oh fantastic yeah absolutely great she's amazing Final question, if we could bring the T-Rex back with cloning, would you vote yes or no to do it? No, I would vote no. If there is anything we have learned from that Jurassic movie, <laughs> that whole franchise, How it much is... fun it can be, right? <laughs> it's entertaining, at least. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, it is entertaining. Um, no, because I think there are so many other species that we could bring back that would be so much more interesting than a T-Rex. Um, I think T-Rexes, too dangerous. There's not really much point in bringing them back. I don't really feel like they're going to add to the ecosystem. Um, I would, if we were going to do cloning, I would bring back something else. Maybe the dodo, something more fun. The kiwi. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, Grace, thanks so much. This was a lot of fun. And uh, I hope you continue to advocate as, as uh, emphatically as you've been doing over the years. <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great to join. Thanks, guys.